the kingdom of God I've been asked to speak on, and uh, and uh, that's no trouble for me. That's my life message. So I'll be very happy to do that. If you've heard me speak on the subject we're speaking on tonight, then as Jesus said, again I say unto you. If you haven't heard, <laughs> then, <laughs> right? If Jesus needed to repeat it, I guess we do as well. So um, tonight, I, uh, Brian just asked me to share around the subject, or when I saw my headings at least, um, just around introduction to the kingdom and how to develop a kingdom theology. It's interesting when you talk about that kind of thing, like a kingdom theology, what does it really mean? And um, we're going to look at just a little bit of that in this hour tonight, and, um, and then other branches out of that we'll do a little bit tomorrow. There's a man in the USA called Charles Caron, and many, um, I guess a number of years ago, I don't know exactly when, but he wrote an article, and in that article he penned with just a couple of little alterations in it, but he said this. He said, The day that Jesus, as a young Jewish rabbi, climbed the hill above Galilee, the world little knew it faced a moment of historic change. In that brief period, the disciples seated on rocks and grass were the first to hear his gospel of the kingdom. Now, of course, we talk on what we know now as the Sermon on the Mount. But uh, the gospel of the kingdom, the message by which he single-handedly challenged world religion and philosophical thinking. Within a few decades, that gospel had turned the world upside down. Acts 17.6 talks about that beginning with the nation of Israel, which was thrown into immediate panic, to Rome, whose world domination ended and the slavery system abolished, Jesus' gospel of the kingdom brought cataclysmic change. 2,000 years later, that gospel now is challenging the very church which it established in the beginning. It's a wonderful, no one could say it much better than that. Another man, Reverend Sam Pascoe, he said this, on the history of Christianity and modified a little bit as well over the time. But Christianity started in Palestine as a fellowship or as a government and family. It moved to Greece and became a philosophy. It moved to Italy, Rome, and became an institution. It moved to Europe and became a culture. And it came to America and became an enterprise or a business. He shared that one time in a discipleship kind of school and um, when he said the church had become too much, you know, like it had come right down to where it's often just seen as a business now, a girl put up a hand in the meeting, a 16-year-old girl, I think, and uh, she asked a question, and he wrote an article, uh, this uh, gentleman, called The Question That Changed My Life. And she asked this question. She said, sir, did you say that when it reached America, Christianity became a business. And he said, yes, I said that. And she said, well, isn't the church the bride of Christ? He said, yes. She said, well, sir, when a woman becomes a business, don't we call that prostitution? The question that changed his life. He was pastoring and shepherding quite a large church at the time and began to dismantle everything to find reality and what really is the kingdom of God in the midst of all this stuff that we do called church in our Western world today. And so out of some of those thoughts, I just throw them in as a little bit of, a, you know, just thinking for you. But there's a shift going on in the earth. And that shift is really quite dramatic. About 40 years ago or so, I um, began to understand this coming January 1, Marilyn and I would have been married 50 years. And three three years after, three months after we got married, we went into training with the Salvation Army and then um, ended up going on into what we're doing now, really. Little did we know then, that's where it was going to take us. But in that 50 year journey, and particularly the last 40 years, as we've become to establish the ministry that we've been leading or founding and leading around the world. Um, we've been on a journey of trying to understand the kingdom of heaven. And for those who have been at Dove conferences, you know, Larry often gets me to share there something around the kingdom or something in that area. 
because it really has become a passion in my heart. And when we finish out tomorrow afternoon, we'll share a little bit, as Brian's asked, just on the father-son issue of it, raising up sons to govern the kingdom. But if I have a life message, which I have now, and out of that life message, I could best say it this way, um, establishing the kingdom of heaven on earth through fathers and sons. Because this kingdom is something that when you, it gets hold of you and you get hold of it, all you'll ever be able to say, as a spiritual father said to me, I'm ruined and I'm glad. I can never go back to anything else now. Uh, Miles Munro, who was a very good teacher before his tragic death on the kingdom of heaven, but Miles Munro once said this, he said he went four years through a well-known Bible college in the USA and then did a master's or some doctorate after that for another two years. And he said in that time, he heard hundreds and maybe thousands of messages about every subject you can imagine, but never heard one about the message. And Jesus said, when you go, preach this message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. It's amazing the amount of sermons we can preach that really do not have their foundation in a kingdom understanding. And so tonight we're just going to share a little bit what is that um, kingdom theology in a sense? How do we develop it? What, what does it really look like? When we talk about that, what do we mean? Because you can hear that word tossed around all kinds of ways today. And sometimes, you know, sometimes I've heard people say things like this. I, I lead a church in a town and um, we, we, we build real unity in the body of Christ and we build with other churches because we really have a kingdom mindset. Well, really, that's still the church mindset. Because when Jesus looks down, he just sees one church in the community. You know, that's still the gospel of the church, really, which is a wonderful part of the kingdom. And it's an important part of the kingdom, what we just said, but it's not still the gospel of the kingdom. What is this gospel of the kingdom? And uh, I want to go through just a basic few points with you tonight that's a skeleton of developing that. So I said in Matthew 10, 7, Jesus said, As you go, preach, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. That was a great commission to the disciples, wasn't it? You know, that was nearly two years before they got saved. So you can imagine what they're going to do after they got saved. I often think about that. I mean, they couldn't have got saved to the cross, could they? So under Jesus' anointing, they went out and did this. But the one thing that they could actually do and had to hold in their heart was to preach this one message. The kingdom of heaven is at hand. There are two great commissions given in the Bible. The great commission is given twice. When you're around the church life many times and people talk about the great commission, they'll refer to the gospels. And rightfully so, because that is a great um, part of the kingdom. I said to the worship band, they're very free to eat their dinner while I share tonight. So no one feel upset or please eat your sandwiches and enjoy them to the full. <laughs> Hallelujah. We can smell the onion coming up the side. <laughs> so it's, it's fine. No trouble. Please take your freedom. Amen. We had the joy of eating before. Oh, and this is family, isn't it? Not a meeting. That's why I feel a little bit too high up here. I'll find my way down there somehow tomorrow, with or without lights. We will get there. But um, just relax and feel free. But there's two times that this great commission was given. One was in the Gospels, but it was first given, if you understand kingdom, it was first given in Genesis. The second time it was given in the Gospels, as we have it there, was really the replay of the first time. And in that great commission, when it was given in Genesis, it was given in a way that it said, God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. Then God blessed them and God said to them, be fruitful and multiply, fill the earth and subdue it, having dominion over all the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, and over everything that lives and moves on the sea. So what was the great commission that was given to them? The Great Commission, really, and I'll come back to that again in a moment, but the Great Commission was to populate the earth primarily through family and in it take rulership over everything else that God created. 
It's a wonderful picture. We talk about the dominion mandate. But kingdom dominion theology, we've got to come to that understanding that it was given in the beginning, and when it was given the second time, it was only a continuance of what was given the first time. One thing to understand kingdom theology that sometimes can rattle with many people's Christian minds is to come to an understanding that God's original intent is his eternal intent. Sin did not change God's mind of his purpose for the earth. It was just an interruption. Amen? Now, many people would believe it the other way. No, sin messed it up. We got worse and worse, and it's still going to get worse and worse until it gets so bad, there's no hope left, and we're going to get raptured out of here. Well, that is not the kingdom theology. I'm not talk, making a comment on rapture or anything like that here tonight. Just saying we have a victorious eschatology if you understand kingdom life. We're not here to lose, we're here to win. And what Jesus intended for the earth in the beginning is his eternal intent as well as his original intent. So he created Adam and Eve, I had the joy of sharing with some of these most powerful, wonderful students over the last couple of days. And we're talking a little bit about some of this. So sorry, again I say unto you. But um, one of the good things that Adam was given work, wasn't he, before he was given a wife. And that's a good thing when you raise spiritual sons. But Adam was given work and he was given a job, and I won't go into all of that tonight, but he was given a job to name all the animals and, and um, I sometimes joke in there about Australia, but he was given uh, time to ha name all the animals, koala bear, kangaroo, and everything else that was there in the garden. And um, as he was naming them, at the end of it, God said to him, Adam, did you find yourself a mate? We joke about that because in Australia everyone has a mate. <laughs> but did you find yourself a mate? And Adam said, no, there's not one there like me. That's a strange little discussion, really. First, God never asked him to look for a mate. But the most powerful thing is Adam said, no, there's nothing there like me. What was God emphasizing into his heart? You, as a human, Adam, are created as different to the animal creation and to the plant creation to anything else. There is no similarity because you were created of this natural realm to contain the other realm. Well, everything else was created just out of this natural realm. So therefore, in an animal, just say for instance, their soul is related to their flesh. For kingdom people, their soul is related to their spirit. Sadly, in church life many times, but people still have their soul related to their flesh. So everything often around the gospel of the church hinges around the flesh. Oh, I didn't like the music, I didn't like that preacher, I didn't like this, uh, so I'm going to leave and go somewhere else. You know, it's like what's satisfying just my soul and my flesh. But in spirit life, our soul is the dictated to by our spirit, not the other way around. And when that's in place, something begins to happen. And in the midst of all that, after Adam was given a wife, and we know how that wonderfully happened. He was put to sleep and out of the closest thing to his heart, out came this wonderful being called Eve, and we call a woman, a man with a womb that came out, and there she was, woman, born to be the helpmate and co-visionary with Adam. The Great Commission wasn't just given to Adam, the covenant was made with Adam, but the Great Commission was both given to Adam and Eve together. And that great commission was what I read to you in Genesis 1, 26 to 28. So God created man in his image. He created him male and female. He created them. What do we learn from that is that we can never understand the fullness of God without both male and female involvement. It's impossible in a male-only situation to really understand the fullness of God, although God can move and work in situations because it takes both sides of what he created to express the fullness of him. In the Bible, you see the wonderful masculine side of God, the, the warrior, the champion, the, the taker of nations, and, 
And you see what sometimes is referred to more the female side as, as that mother hen gathering the chicks under him. He is the complete package of humanity. And so to express that, he had to express both male and female to express the fullness of himself. And so in the midst of that wonderful thing, this kingdom began to get formed on the earth. A song we were singing a little while ago is a wonderful song, isn't it? The world behind me, the cross before me, I have decided to follow Jesus. Understand the man who wrote that all those years ago. We used to sing that 40 years ago in church and in Sunday school, that last bit of it. But understand the man who wrote it, wrote it because literally there was a physical cross, martyrdom before him. And he was laying everything aside to embrace the cross. But for you and I, really in kingdom life when we embrace it, it's almost a reverse of that. See, for us, it's the cross behind us, the world before us. See, for Jesus, he went through the cross, the cross was behind him, and he moved forward from the cross in the resurrected life to change the world forever. William Booth once said an incredible thing, the founder of the Salvation Army. He said, many people want to follow Christ. What they don't realize was he traveled from heaven to earth, not the other way around. See, we want to follow Christ from earth to heaven. But he came from heaven to earth. And so the message of the kingdom, you're getting a little clue, begins to shake some of our beliefs. I was very blessed, I guess, with my upbringing, although maybe not realizing it at the time. But I came being raised through a Salvation Army, which many people know little about, but particularly down in the USA. But being raised in the Salvation Army, that was very much built on a, a very strong biblical kingdom theology, really. And so um, I didn't know anything different, really. I really probably didn't even know that growing up. But when I began to understand kingdom, it wasn't a, it wasn't a shock to me, in a sense. It's what, in some ways, I would always had a little bit of understanding to believe. And I realized others come from a different theological background where maybe they've been raised in a more of a defeatist atti attitude or believing the world's just going to get worse and worse and worse and worse, and then one day we're going to leave it. But it's very difficult to embrace that and embrace a true kingdom theology. So if you've come from that kind of background tonight, it's probably going to rattle and roll you a little bit to begin to think uh, the other way, and you've got to settle in your heart what you end up believing yourself. But there's something... When you start to talk about raising spiritual sons for kingdom life and you start to work in the marketplace, you start to build companies, you start to generate economies that can affect the economies of the world. Um, you know, I was telling these uh, students and others that were with us north of here over the last couple of days, I told the story of a little church that happened in Wales that's a part of our family. and. Uh, how Mar and I went there for two weeks outreach and ended up staying two years back in the 70s. And that in many ways is where what we became Church of the Nations really sprang out of. And they, they've had such an incredible, I won't say that whole story again, but an incredible time of just seeing the kingdom of God advance in that community. Very godless community prior to that. The history, if I told you the whole history, is just remarkable. But I got an email from Naomi who leads it just after I finished talking with the, the students about the story of this little Milford Haven in Wales. And she said, how do you love this headline? And there was a headline in the papers for the whole area that just said in that region where we had the church established and taken on all the strongholds, started to transform the community, the businesses, politics, everything else, the headline just read, crime in this area in the last two months is down 30%. Why? Because when the kingdom is established, life changes, not just for believers, but for everyone. Because the Bible says the kingdom grows like a mustard seed and provides shade and shadow for everybody. And I was just sharing that with the students as that principle, and then the testimony came through within 24 hours of the change that comes. And so here was this dominion mandate to move and shift and change society, to change the world, to populate the earth. Now you need to understand this, Adam and Eve were given the authority to rule over everything else that God made. 
They were not given the authority to rule over each other. You see, when we don't kingdom rule the earth, we'll end up ruling other men or other women. Because within us is given the authority to rule as believers. The only question we've got is, what and who do we rule? Man wasn't here to rule over women. Women were not here to rule over men. They were here in their specific roles that God gives. But Adam and Eve together were giving a, a, a dominion mandate to rule over everything else that God created. They call it a dominion mandate. But then something happened. There was a tree and there was a fruit. And there was a woman and there was a man. And there was a serpent. And we all know the story of the fall of man. And in that fall of man, something tragic took place, as we know. And when that took place, something changed that one day had to be fully redeemed for this gospel of the kingdom so God's everlasting intent could get back to his eternal intent. And when that happened, the temptation came, you know, there was a tree that they were not meant to eat from and Adam was told why and Eve eventually took, a, took the fruit and Adam was there, they shared it and you know, the end, a, a tragic moment happened. And I won't go through that whole story tonight because we know it well as believers. But what happened in that moment was the covenant was broken. Now I want you to get this in your heart tonight. The covenant was broken that God had made with Adam. The Adamic covenant was broken. There had been a breach in that relationship. And when the covenant was broken, something happened. Now we're just seeing in a small phrase really in, the, in, the, in Genesis, it's enlarged in the New Testament, but in that phrase, we see God coming into the garden where he came regularly. He walked and talked with Adam in the evening and they had fellowship together. Their eyes were... Could you imagine what it must have been like when God physically was walking with Adam in that garden and they looked at one another and began to talk? You know what it's like when you hear a prophetic word from God or God... Did, do you imagine what it was like just... This is our after dinner walk. This time God came and something was different in the garden. And he cried out something. I love to preach a message that I call two voices from heaven, two voices to heaven, and the 12 hours that rock the earth. But this is one of the voices from heaven. The voice came out from heaven. Satan, oh sorry, Adam, where are you? Now if you just read that, understandably we could just think, He's saying, Adam, what tree are you behind? Where are you hiding? Adam, where are you? But I believe he was asking something far deeper and far more real than that. So he came back into this colony called Earth. It was created as a reflection of the realm where God lived. And he loved this place. He loved it so much, he, he you know, put Adam and Eve here to tend it, to rule it to populate it, to everything. God loves this earth. I want to say this to you today. If you've got that in your heart, you know the saddest thing about one of the sad things about the day that we live in is the greenies take more care of God's earth than we do. But God loves this earth. He loves it. When I'm raising spiritual sons and working with spiritual sons, if you're walking down the street and there's an ice cream paper, paper falling on the street, pick it up and put it in the trash. Why? Because the earth is the Lord's. Yeah. He says he loves the place. You'll put here to tend it and care for it. Don't become a part of the problem. <coughs> Sad when so many people who don't even believe in God take better care of it than we do. Not all greenies don't, don't believe in God, don't get me wrong, but many, you know. And so, Adam, where are you? What was he really saying? He said, I come back into this colony that I've made for you and Eve to rule and reign and to populate it. I had such vision and dreams for you all. And when I come back, Satan's on the throne ruling it. 
Adam, where are you? See, if God was to say something over Canada tonight and ask you a question, you can ask, where is the right-wing parties? Where are the left-wing parties? Where's the centrist parties? He's just going to ask, Kingdom Church, where are you? Oh, we found ourselves a comfortable pew. And that's all we can think of to do. We get up once a week and go to church. Isn't that enough, Father? Adam, where are you? I look and Satan is ruling. Well, you can go all the way through history from there. It's an incredible story, isn't it? All the way through, we find this call coming from a father's heart, trying to call people back to himself, to get them back into the rulership and reign of the earth. But all the time, religion was replacing relationship. Until God let a man to marry a prostitute to show out some thing, a man called Hosea, and I won't go into all the whole story of Hosea's life tonight. But in the midst of it all, you hear the cry of God, a father's heart really coming out. I don't want your burnt offerings. I don't want your religion. I don't want your sacrifices. Don't tell me what you do for me and cost you. I don't want your sacrifices. I don't want your burnt offerings. I want you to love me. I want you to know me. I put Adam in the east so I could walk and talk with them and love them and share and father them in all that I created them to be. The further we go through this, humanity that came out of all that, you're just getting further and further and further away from what my heart was for you. Sometimes I wonder what he feels about most of us today, or most of what testifies to being Christian at times. But it goes all the way down. There was Noah. If any of you saw a film that came out two, three, two or three years ago written by an atheist called Noah, it was a great movie to watch. I saw more kingdom principles in that than I've heard in most sermons. I went with a spiritual son, Marilyn, and I was a spiritual son and his wife in South Africa. We couldn't stop talking kingdom all the time after. But there's a tremendous battle when rage went on in the middle of it. Or when... You know, it's not biblically accurate, so never go to a film written by an atheist and expect it to be biblically accurate. <laughs> people, say, people say, you know, that really wasn't accurate to the Bible. Said, oh, really? What a shock. You know, that's a shock. Did you really go and believe it was? It's written by an atheist. Good night. But in this actual story, he had such insight. Because as the ark was going, and you know there were some things on the ark that wasn't biblical, but there were children being born to a one member of the family, and the battle was going on where Noah was thinking about killing the children in that because it was getting out of hand. And people said, oh, you know, that was really had them raise their hands. But when you heard what his heart was really saying, it was because he couldn't quite get over one fundamental problem. And that fundamental problem was this. God, the earth is a mess. You have to destroy all humanity with a hope of restoring what your intention was. But there's a huge problem. I will still be there. And aren't I a part of the problem? And now if there's a couple more kids, aren't they a part of the problem? How are we ever going to deal with it? And we know in history... When I was sitting there watching that, my heart was just so charged. Because you know, eventually the ark stopped on the mountain. They were off and there was Noah all naked and his sons, before they went out into what their life was, covered him and covered his nakedness and protected him. But he just had so lost hope in who he was himself because, you know, what Adam had messed up was still here in him. It was the great battle. And we know the fruit of that was it didn't deal with all the problem. And so another centuries went by, many of them, until eventually God's only hope of restoring what was lost. All he could do was really start it all over again. 
It didn't work with different things, didn't work with Noah, all the way through. And now the only way he can do it is to recreate Adam. And the only way he can recreate Adam is from himself. And so the Bible says, a last Adam was born. Isaiah saw him unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, his name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, etc., etc. Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. The kingdom would be upon his shoulders and something would be redone. And this kingdom that he would reestablish would know nothing but increase. From this day on, the Bible says, it would know nothing but increase. And then Marilyn's favorite verse, one of her favorite verses follows that, which keeps us going 50 years on the journey. It finishes by saying this, the zeal of the Lord shall perform it. Aren't you glad it's not up to our strength? But the zeal of the Lord, a zealous God, will perform this. But there's going to be an endless kingdom on earth, a dominion that would know nothing but end, and until eventually he said all the kingdoms of this world will become the kingdoms of our God and the full restoration, etc., would go on. So who was Jesus? He was the first man since Adam to be born of this natural and yet filled with the other realm. See, that's what differed Adam from the animals. And there was no one on earth once the fall of man had happened all the way through until this time there was not another man on earth that was made of this natural realm and filled with the other realm. Until that wonderful day when this babe was born. Made of this natural flesh, but born in the spirit. Jesus never had to be born again, but if you want to compare him to us, he was born and born again the same second. If you know what I mean. He was born of water, born of the spirit. He was born of the natural and of the spirit. It all happened at once because of the incarnation. Most incredible thing. And so what was going to happen for Adam? This is kingdom theology getting a bit more serious now. If he was going to keep this original intent of God going, of his father going, he not only had to forgive us of our sin, but he had to reclaim everything the first Adam had lost. That was the huge challenge. And that's the foundation, really, of kingdom theology. He had to take back what was lost in order that on earth it could all be back again to the fullness that eventually could release the king to come. So after that wonderful journey of his life, from being a child to being a son to being a father, that we go, or a son, and he heard the water, in the waters of baptism that day, this cry, this is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Father led him somewhere. Where did he lead him? Straight into temptation. I mean, what a start to your ministry. Straight out of this is my beloved son, go meet the devil. <laughs> Not only that, you're going to get hungry. <laughs> Go be in the wilderness, go meet the devil. Why? Because the first, that's where the first Adam lost it. The covenant was broken in temptation. So the first place the new Adam had to go was in the temptation to reclaim it. See, how do you and I know that we're going to see this through to fullness and the victory of the earth? I can tell you in one sentence. Our Adam didn't break the covenant. So our life is hid away with Christ in God. That's a wonderful thing. We don't have to win it. It's won. And our Adam will not break the covenant. Not now, but not then. And so he was led into temptation. You just think of it. God took him up onto a mountain. Uh, Satan took him up onto a mountain and said, as far as you look, as far as your eyes can see, just bow to me and I'll give you kingdom rule over all you can see. And Jesus said, it is written. Man will not do that. Why? Because what he knew what was written, he didn't come back for a bit. He came back for it all. 
He was going to establish kingdom rule over it all. Not a little bit that Satan was going to let him have. He said, turn, you're hungry, turn these rocks into bread and eat. And Jesus said, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone. What was he saying? I've got all the power, all the authority in the world to turn this into bread. But the power that's given to me, I want to use for something much more than just my personal need getting met. Something much more at stake here. Something much bigger. You see, he won the victory to establish the covenant. And then his life went on. You know, as it went on through the next three years, Matthew, come follow me. Hey, John. Peter, how are you doing? You've done enough fishing for a while. Come follow me. He began to call different ones. They began to travel with him. Must have been such an exciting time. And as these men began to form and they began to become this radical band, one day as they were traveling it, they were going to face a tremendous dynamic moment. The world's right there again right now globally in its greatest moment in releasing the fullness of the kingdom before the king comes back now, I believe. But they're going to release it. They were going to face an incredible moment. You see, the world was going to vote, a very important vote. And Jesus was held up before the people. You see, Jesus was a young radical. He had a band of disciples that were traveling the world, doing a lot of the area, doing a lot of great things in the name of God, as you know. And he was fathering them and discipling them. But there was also another radical young man at that time as well. He was a zealot. And he had a band of disciples as well that were traveling the area, the same area at the same time. This man was a murderer. Eventually he got arrested for his deeds and put into prison. And then Jesus got arrested. And here was these two radical young revolutionaries in their 30s. One was a hate revolutionary and one was a love revolutionary. And the authorities of the day stood before them and said, you vote today. Do you want a violent revolution or a love revolution? And they voted for violence and said, put love on the cross. The cross couldn't hold love. I wonder if it would have held violence. We've got a young generation alive today faced with exactly the same question globally. The world is going to change, either through a love revolution or a violence one right now. But I tell you, there is a militant army of God's people on earth that's choosing for a love revolution. They'll turn the world upside down, and this time hate will go to the cross. Well, not to the cross necessarily, but you know what I mean. That's another sermon. I won't get sidetracked there. And then came the incredible moment when Jesus went to the cross. Kingdom theology is an exciting thing. When Jesus went to a cross, you know, one of the things I had to learn in my heart, and I want you to be careful when I say this, but a lot of modern day music, even a lot of modern day worship music, a lot of day Christian music keeps us at the center of it all. It's scary. Don't get me wrong when I say this, if this is your favorite song. But there was a song out a little while ago, a year, two or three years ago. It was a beautiful song. It was a song about a rose crushed under the foot. Remember that song? Just like a rose. As you died, Jesus, above everything else, you had me on your mind. I struggled with that. I don't know what Jesus was all going through his head, but I want to tell you, as a man dying on the cross that day, I'm really not sure he had me on his mind. He had humanity, praise God, but I'm not sure he had Tony Fitzgerald just individually. I'm sure as he died on that cross that day, he had his father on his mind, pleasing, doing the will of his father, the kingdom heart of his dad, to take this world and to reform it and get back into its original intent. Praise God it included all of us. But I want to tell you, I do not see myself as the center of what God's about. I believe 
what Jesus was all about. His father was the centre of what he was all about. Because his eyes was fixed on something and someone and something he was caused to do. Now, praise God, I'm sure we're included in that, so I'll give you a freebie there. <laughs> but on that cross that day, with the weight of everything upon his shoulders, he cried out something very powerful. He cried out, it is finished. The greatest question as a Christian, if you want to live in kingdom theology or live a kingdom life, that you've got to ask yourself, what was finished? If you believe you are the total center of the gospel, then what you will believe is your sin problem was finished. Praise God it was included. But it wasn't what was finished, only finished that moment. When he cried out, it is finished, he was saying to rulers and principalities above the earth, under the earth, on the earth, an incredible profound thing. He was saying to Satan, eyeball to eyeball, Satan, your rule of the earth is finished. Adam is back. God's original rulership of the earth is back. He became known as the last Adam. But it wasn't good for man to dwell alone. As God said for the first Adam. The first time he put him to sleep, took out near the closest thing to his heart. What was he going to do for the last Adam? This time he had put him to sleep, as we know, straight after that declaration. This time on the cross and near the closest thing to his heart, water and blood began to flow and it flowed into a little house where a few struggling believers were waiting. In the end, after that resurrection, as it all was, you know, Jesus walked into that house and he breathed upon them and said, Receive ye the Holy Ghost. And in an incredible moment of history, Eve was born. We call her the church. The body of Christ, whatever. But the church, made of the same stuff now, of this natural realm, but filled with the other realm. Jesus is so excited to see them. He said, listen, before you do anything else, now just go to Jerusalem and wait for a while because I'm going to fill you with power. You know, when you get that spirit of God within you, there's still a measure of power that we still got to go and get. You know, sometimes we as charismatics or Pentecostals will say, sometimes say something foolish like you do not have the Holy Spirit in you unless you're baptized in the Spirit. You cannot be born again and not have the Spirit of God within you. The question is not having God in us, it's us being put into God, baptized in the Spirit, into the power, so we receive the power that comes with that to become the agents of releasing that power out into the world. It is finished. He renders Satan powerless through his death and resurrection, as said in Hebrews 2.14. Up to that moment, Satan was still, in a sense, the ruler of the earth. But in that moment on the cross, he rendered him and then into his resurrection, he rendered Satan powerless because Adam was back on the throne to rule the earth. The last Eve, and then the Great Commission came again. And Jesus came and spoke to them, saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and earth. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things that I've commanded you. Remember, he didn't say go and make some disciples in a nation. He said go and make disciples of the nation. Observe all the things I've commanded you, and lo, I'm with you always, even to the end of the age. Amen. So here was Adam and Eve now with their mandate that Jesus with his bride would be given that mandate to go and populate the earth, evangelize it, win it. But until the, not just people in it, but the very kingdoms and nations of themselves were disciples. And the kingdoms of this world became the kingdoms of our God. In Matthew, in preparation with those sons he was raising up, he said to them, and I also say to you, Peter, 
Upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. What was that? The spirit of revelation. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. What was he saying? I'm giving you and I with you. We're going to have the keys of the kingdom like Adam and Eve were to rule and reign over everything else. We have full authority. In Psalms 24, 1 it says, The earth is the Lord's and all its fullness, the world and those who dwell therein. Psalms 115, 16 says, The heavens are the heavens of the Lord, but the earth he has given to the sons of men. Isn't it incredible? The heavens are the Lord's, but he's given the rulership of the earth to us. You know the most lonely place you could ever be? is in a prayer meeting asking God to do what he's told you to do. <laughs> Amen. Isaiah 9, 6, Therefore there will be no end of the increase of God's government on the earth. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will accomplish it. Luke 12, 32, It is the Father's good pleasure to give you the kingdom. That was said before, fear not, little flock. You cannot have fear and faith. Because fear is only faith in the devil. Fear triples. But faith releases. It says, fear not, little flock. The kingdom come now when God was teaching his son, Jesus was teaching his sons to pray. He said, pray this way, your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Stop and pause for a moment and ask yourself, how is the will of God done in heaven right this moment? And get a picture of how he wants it done on earth. No sickness, no poverty, no broken relationships. That's what we're believing for. Daniel 7.14 says, then to him who was given dominion and glory and a kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him, his dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom the one which shall not be destroyed. And where is his kingdom? Your kingdom come on earth. It shall not be destroyed. Daniel 7, 18 uh, Daniel 7, 18 and 27. But the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever and ever and ever. Then the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdoms under his whole heaven shall be given to the people, the saints of the Most High. His kingdom is an everlasting kingdom and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Iraq, you will obey him. Every kingdom on the earth will obey him. We have a message to bring. All the saints of the Most High shall receive the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever and ever. In Romans 5 is one of the most wonderful passages on the kingdom that never mentions the word kingdom. Because it says there that Jesus died to restore all that was lost. It said what one man, Adam, brought into the world, how much more, not just the same amount, how much more has one man, Christ Jesus, restored? Ask yourself what did Adam lose, then have a look what he's restored. Or is it in the process of restoring? Here's the final thought. Right on time. The question is, who leaves and who stays? Well, here's a clue. Jesus prayed this. I do not ask, in John 17, I do not ask that you will take them out of the world. Why? Because he's placed us here to rule and reign. 
What simply is kingdom theology? What God originally intended is his eternal intent. What happened on the cross was the reclaiming of everything that Adam ever lost. To raise up that last Adam, the last Eve, that we could fulfill everything the first Adam and Eve missed and restore and give it all back to God. There's a wonderful scripture. I won't read it to, the, to tonight. But it says this on it, as it all works through on the earth, as everything is finally restored and the king returns. And it says, Jesus himself will rule here on earth with us to fulfill something to a wonderful moment in history. And it says in that moment of history, it says when the last thing, even death, it says when he's back this time, next time, he will put even that under his feet and then present this kingdom complete back to his dad. And you know the good news? We will be there. If he comes before we go, we'll be there. If he comes after we go, we'll be there in the resurrection of the dead. But we'll be there. As he, this son gives back, the last Adam gives back to his father. This totally restored earth of all the fullness and everything about it. Back so the father can receive the fullness of what he originally intended. What a story. That doesn't get you up in the morning and want to say hallelujah. Mm -hmm. Nothing will. Mm -hmm.